That's fine. Okay, so I guess we can get started. I apologize for, for my voice. Actually, I feel fine, but I'm, I'm, uh, I've got some critter in my... So, um, today the objective is to um, get our heads around stochastic programming, which is a tool that I personally feel is underutilized. Uh, there's a class of problems of the type that were discussed yesterday where we have we have a very simple like two stage stochastic programming involves here and now here we are we make a decision and we're into a new world and there's a set of states and we we can't each of those states is different than we can't predict which one's going to come out and there's a probability so the basically decision making is done on the basis of likelihood of different events transpiring. So that type of stochastic programming with like one, a simple one stage process or two stage process is useful for many settings, but there are a number of applications where having a larger model is useful. The key problem is that in stochastic programming, the curse of dimensionality looms large. Are we, going to use the we will use the computers, yes. Uh, and, the, and you can put it away for now, and then in the second part, I, I have I've loaded all the files we need up there. And in this, my okay. So the goal, the game plan for today is I'm going to tell you about stochastic programming. I'm going to go through a stochastic, a revised version of the dice model I went through last time, that, where I've put stochastic recourse in with uh, the catastrophes. So that'll be one model to go through, and then I'll do it, go through another small model with catastrophes as well, just to get the basic sort of framework straight. So we have two models. And then the goal for the second half is I want to have us team up in groups of three, three people. And I want us to just explore the models. I'm going to show you the tools for doing sensitivity analysis. And the objective is each group thinks up on their own what they'd like to do with the model and do a simulation. And I'd like to actually have it be a simple calculation with comparisons. But I'm, what I'm asking you to do is to actually carry it forward to where you can produce three PowerPoint slides describing what you did, what the results were. So the idea is just to go through the process of using the model. We're not going to get any deep insights into stochastic programming, but we will learn how to use the model. So when you pick your groups of three, the key thing is there should be somebody who's computer savvy, somebody who's economically literate, and someone who else is interested in the issues. My suggestion is, <laughs> my recommendation is the person who is interested in the issues, they have to type. So the person who knows how to, has done a lot of computing, they're not in charge. It's the person who, who's done the least work with the PC has to be in charge. And so the other people tell them what to do, they have to type. It's like taking turns driving, right? Um, this is really a useful, the idea is just get it in your fingers. It's not so much we're gonna, not going to get a lot of deep insight. It's not going to be profound, but it's going to be this process of actually doing something together. And there's also something, I don't know, I'm terrible at your name. Uh, our Swedish colleague, uh, Anders. Anders is from the software industry. And it's kind of funny because back in 2002, 2001, 2002, Rich Rituals came to me. It was after Alan Mann's untimely death. Tidy but untimely death. Alan was always a very tidy guy. He had everything under control. And he, he fell off his horse at age 83, preparing for a dressage competition. And luckily, there was a Stanford heart surgeon in, at the, sta at the uh, stables who kept him alive. And they got him to the hospital. And uh, he was in a coma. And then his wife and his daughter is a, like a pr film producer, works with Robert Redford. And so his daughter flies in from New York. He's been in a coma for three days. His wife and his daughter go into his hotel room. He wakes up. He talks to them for a while. And then he says, well, you should bring the doctor in. The doctor comes in. The doctor says, Alan, I'm afraid it looks bad. Looks like you've fallen. You're, it looks like you may have done something to your spine. You're probably not going to be able to walk again. As soon as he, Alan heard that, he said, OK, I've had enough of you. <laughs> Go away. <laughs> and then he proceeds to talk with his daughter quite cogently about the seven different papers he's working on, where they are, how things could be organized. He says goodbye to his wife and his daughter. And then two hours later, he dies. The guy was like, it, just remarkable. So. What we're learning today is stuff that I learned from him in 1980. 
So this is stuff that's, we think this is profound. It's not profound. This is a tool that's been around for a long time. And I, I'm a bit of an outsider. I, I don't, I'm not, because I wasn't trained originally as an economist, I learned economics just teaching economics. I don't always follow the, I don't always follow the hymn book about how you do stuff. But my perception is that a lot of economics has gone off, has this perception that stochastic programming is incredibly impossible. And there's this view that every, every time you have a stochastic program, you have to design an algorithm to solve that problem. And I'm trying to, what I'd like to show you today is there's a large set of problems in the middle. They're not trivial two-stage problems. They're not, and they're not ultra-large, but they're the type that you can get work, work, workable insight into the issue, and you can solve them on your PC. And if you're careful about how you can do it, you can have a control over how much complexity you put into the model. Because the key thing is with stochastic programs, it's about how many states of the world, how big a tree you have. And the whole thing is just having, getting your mind around how you control the tree, that's the key ticket. Because if you can control the tree, then you can keep track, you can keep things at a stage that you can get insight from a small model, you can see what happens when it starts to get larger. You may conclude that this is a problem that I can't, I can't understand with this framework. I have to do, go off to use, employ Mr. Bellman's technique for doing it. If you want to do that, that's fine. But I personally, my whole thing is, I, if, if the problem is too big for my, my solver to handle it, it's probably too complex for me to understand it. So I don't, I tend to not like to use problems where I have to let go. I like problems where I have everything right there. I can see the model right in front of me, right? So what we're doing today really is learning how to handle trees that are multi-stage. It's called multi-stage stochastic programming. And before I jump into this, I have a lecture here that, so what I have today is I have uh, three models and then, um, and then I have, I did some work yesterday. I should have been working on my lectures. I didn't make them very slick because I was working on Sven's problem. So I have a little model that has uh, this other Epstein's in preferences compared for a little Ramsey model. So I can show you what that looks like. In, in GAMS and stochastic programming framework. I still don't understand it completely, but it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of useful to see. And that example provides an example of, because in your, in your side of the world, you have a tree that always gets, that's going really big. So that's different than the tree I'm gonna look at. So most of the problems we'll work on today are ones that involve what they're, what they're known in, in the decision sciences literature as, st as stopping problems. So it's a stopping problem, which is I, I'm, I'm always, when I hear about stopping problems, I always remember my PhD qualifying exam, which was, you're going to the movie theater, which is in the center of town. The parking, the parking slots are numbered, so you know, how many, you know how many parking slots you are from the middle of the town. For some reason, I'm not sure why. The problem gets much more interesting if you let P be a function of how many dist far you are away. But if P is IID, they're all probability P, they're gonna be open. You're driving toward the center of town. You see a spot that's open. Do you park there or not? You know you're 150 slots away. Do you take the time to go forward or do you stop at that point and take it? How do you minimize the time it takes to get, the distance you have to walk, right? It's a wonderful problem because I, stopping time, I, usually, I immediately think that problem, but I also think that problem just about every week, anytime I'm driving around, I'm thinking, okay, now I have to decide, do I stop here or do I keep going, right? So the, stopping problems are things where you have to make decisions anticipating an event that may be taking place. And in the stochastic programming world, they're very, these types of problems, I would contend, are quite relevant to climate change. The classic one in, inter, in integrated assessment is catastrophe. You know, why do we want to abate? Certain things we can characterize in terms of market and non-market damages. We do this stuff, we know that the sea level's gonna rise, there's gonna be less productivity. So there's all these smooth stuff, but where's the debate about the, to take action? It all has to do with is there gonna be a catastrophic event, right? So the idea is mitigation is motivated entirely by trying to, trying to reduce the probability of that. So in that sort of world, we have a tree that looks like this. I apologize, it's all discrete time today, I'm nothing. So you have a tree that goes like this. And then at each point, there's going to be So there's a very simple stopping problem. We could have catastrophe immediately. Arctic melting sped up this month. It's going very fast. It's going on record. 
be potentially the, the least ice in the pole. And next 10 years from now, 10 years after that, so you have this thing where you're anticipating. So in this sort of world where you have this tree over here, you're making decisions along here, anticipating that you might have to go down there. So in your real option problem, this is exactly what you're working on. You have to decide, do I mitigate to try to slow the rate of speed or do I invest in adaptation capital to be ready so that when I turn the corner, if we turn the corner, that we're ready to pull that into play. And so that's one tree. Sven's tree, where he's looking at the macro shocks, is a lot more complicated because, so this could go on for as many as we want to, but Sven's tree goes high, low, medium growth, high, low, medium growth, high, low, medium growth, so the problem you can see immediately, this sort of tree is, we have to keep track of what's going on in each one of these little circles. We have to keep track of each node. So this guy gets big fast. So in, in your model, if I have a simple, just a consumption side model where I have uncertainty about GDP growth, then you go to eight, eight time periods, it's already a big model. It's like 40,000 variables. Uh, there's lots you can do to try. I, I mean, uh, you can you can try to you can make approximation guesses in the formulation, but in the, and the other way to do it is to say I write down my model and then I use a formal method for how to how to make it simpler. So there's ways that going about that. And I'll, today at the beginning I'll talk about those methods. Most of the, the stochastic programming, and again I'm just telling you what I think. I'm not. This is not profound stuff, but basically most stochastic programming is specialized algorithms for solving monster problems where it's relatively easy to intuit what the problem is, but it just gets really big really fast. And those types of problems, these are usually things where some sort of dynamic programming method is going to be improved. But again, my, my interest is in things where I can write the model down and see it. I don't trust that I, I'm, not a, I'm not reliable enough about implementing algorithms specific to given models. I like to always have the model be where I can see the equations I can evaluate whether they're true at the point. There's no, you know, there's trade-off. It would be helpful to have administrative rights. I have two programs I'd like to load. Yeah. Under I was just thinking, so as not to waste too much time during the, 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 the class, could I, could I maybe install it on, a, on a, our laptop and then just bring the laptop in when it's ready? Perfect. That way we wouldn't interrupt. That's great. I guess I'd need to send you an email as to what to, what to get. Oh, do I have to download it then? Yeah, do that's right. I have uh, some of it here. Well, can you tell yeah, I actually, I have it here. I do have it here. Uh, yeah, it's on here. Actually, you know, why don't we just wing it? Let's just see what we can do. Let, let's wait. Because the thing is, if I do need it and we're just going to put it on a separate laptop, I can use someone else's laptop in the room. So if that's the, the solution. Yeah, that would be fun. That'd be fun. Okay, that's good. So where were we? Um, okay, so then the whole thing comes down to how do we write down this tree in a way that sort of things make sense? And how do we do it in such a way that we don't shoot ourselves in the foot with having too many dimensions that are unnecessary? Because normally, one way of doing this sort of thing is to say, okay, let's call this one. Uh, now, the thing is, if we, let's first, let's think about, remember, time is going to go this way, and states the world will be this way. So I'm going to call this period, this is t is equal to 0, uh, t is equal to 1, t is equal to 2, t is equal to 3. So those are the time periods. So each one of these is in the same time period. And then we have to have names the way I think about the problem. And I'll show you in the first lecture, I'll show you there are other ways to do it. But the way I think about the problem is I think about giving names to these guys over here. And if we think about this being catastrophe, I'm going to name this one never. I'm going to name this guy 3, 2, oh, I'm sorry, uh, zero, zero, 1, 
to, and never. I'm naming the scenario with the year in which the catastrophe is realized. Do I do that right? Let's see, I guess, I'm sorry, this guy should be, to be consistent with what I did, you can do it however you want to. I'm going to say three is the first year in which we realize we have a catastrophe, two and one, I'm sorry. So one, in other words, here we don't know there's a catastrophe coming. Then we get to, we go to state time period one, and in the, if we're in this line, then we have a catastrophe in that lane we don't. Right? And then we go to the next sta stage, and at that, that point, here we still have a catastrophe realized in, in plot one. Here we have a catastrophe realized in, in period two. This guy we still have never. And then we go to this point. And so you can see that the labeling is, this is, for these stopping problems, it's a very convenient way of labeling it. Because that means that the, the stopping problem then, the labels of the scenarios correspond to the year in which the, the outbound thing was realized. It's completely up to you how you do this. There's no one way to do this. You can give it names. You can call it Fred and Joe and Jane. So there's no need to. But I'm just going to show you now the one sort of thing that we have to bear in mind is that the crucial idea here is that when we're at this node, the consumption in period zero, we usually think about decision variables, let's call it x, as x of st. It says, what's the value of the decision variable in state S in period T. That's the usual way you will record what's going on in the tree. So implicitly, that notation suggests that somehow you have a full set of values for each period of what's going on in each scenario. And in fact, you don't really have to keep track of the full set all the way along, because here, the ones that go, if we call this node one, call this node two, call this node three, we can see that x, x of n one is the same as x of never comma zero, and it's also equal to x of three comma zero, and it's equal to x of two comma zero, and it's equal to x of one comma zero. Because all those if we, if we think about it being x of, so this is the nodal representation of what's going on, and this is the x, s, t not notation, keeping track of by scenario and time period. <laughs> so a lot of the, the writing down of the model just consists of a, of a way to manage the, the logic of the tree. That's the whole thing. And it seems on the surface, I have to admit, I should tell you about this, this is one of these problems. I have several problems that I have from when I was a PhD student. Like a, my favorite was Curtis Eaves asked me a question at my qualifying at my thesis defense that I answered in a paper I wrote 25 years later. So there are problems you kind of carry along with you, and one of the problems I had when I was a graduate student was, boy, what's a stochastic program? How do you write it down algebraically? I I never got my mind around that as a student. How do you write this down in a way that you express exactly what you got? And this is something I came up with a couple of years ago that's really helpful. You guys have already discovered it. So basically, the other people in the world, people working with stochastic programming, a lot of people recognize this way. And different people have ways of doing it. But for me, I've come up with a method that I think is pretty tight and a simple way to keep track of it. So the whole thing will be keeping track of the naming. So the way, rather than using nodal names here, I'm not going to call these n1, n2, and so forth. I'm just going to take one of the scenarios which is embedded in that node, I'm going to use that scenario to label this. So I'm going to call this one never, and I'm going to label this guy never, and label this never. So never consists of everything along that one. And I'm going to label this node to be uh, state one. This is, and this will be state one, and this will be state one, and this will be state two, and this is state two, and this is state three. So here I'm just going to label the nodes with, so they're doubly indexed. There's going to be a what's the scenario and what's the time period. And the crucial thing is just to agree on what name presides. Notice that here, there's no reason I have to say, but I'm basically going to follow the presumption that it's as though you were sorting, imagine the scenarios all being, yes. I was just wondering, now it happens nothing anymore with respect to the uncertainty. What's that? <laughs> the 
There's, there's really no need. I think that you could have it be asymmetric, but I think my intuition is the, the, uh, that you have to you come up with some method of coping with the complexity that would introduce, because it helps to know. To, we're going to come up with a way of referencing what was the parent node to where we're sitting, and that's, that's the whole thing is how to write down the equations that correspond to it. I'm not sure I understand. So, so if the catastrophe happens in the very first year, let's say the catastrophe model, then we're basically in the catastrophe scenario and we're done. Not yeah, OK. Catastrophe. OK. And then all those four nodes where I just drop them. Yeah, in but fact, really, um, you're already anticipating. That's, that's something I do introduce in the third model. That's the way actually I do drop them, those nodes. So we do that, yeah. So you can drop it, you can terminate it earlier. I thought you were asking, can I skip this one and then bring it back up here? That's, that's, you can drop them all, yeah. So we'll figure out, how to do, I'll show you how that, that works. Uh, so there's, that's the thing. When you move from static to dynamic modeling, a couple things happen. One thing you saw in the last lecture, one thing happens is that the, the benchmark national accounts may not match the model because investment in capital stock earnings may not be consistent. So the first thing is, to be at the very beginning is you write down a model and you want to calibrate it to what you observe. What you observe may be inconsistent with the dynamic model. So something has to give. You have to choose a different interest rate, a different discount rate, or you have to change the data. So that's the first thing is matching to the world as we see it as a problem. And the second is when you do a simulation, the number of periods you need depends on what the simulation experiment is you do. So it's no longer the case that I have a model. That static model, everything is tight. I get seven degrees of precision all the time. You can hit it with anything you want. There's the answer. Dynamic model, it's always inherently an approximation. We have tools for getting a reasonable approximation of the horizon, but that's not always going to be the case. So there's a bit of a trick here. There's an art involved in how to design that. But the thing is, what we benefit enormously, though, in, in dynamic models from what's known as, it's called turnpike theorems. So there's this, and you can math this up a lot, but I, I have a very simple intuition about this. So if you're driving, from Milan and you're going to London, or you're driving from Milan and you're going to Copenhagen. When you leave Milan, if you're, if you're taking the shortest path, you're trying to go the fastest, it doesn't matter whether you're going to Copenhagen or London. Because the shortest path will always be get to the turnpike that's going in that direction roughly, and go on that turnpike as fast as you can. You'll depart at the end, depending on whether you're going to Copenhagen or London. At the end, you have to make a change. But the initial path, as long as you're optimizing, the initial path will be independent of what happens out at the horizon. So as long as you're going roughly in that way, then the fastest path will always be involved getting to a freeway and going fast. So that means that these models, that intuition is very powerful, because when somebody comes to you and say, well, but you don't know how many periods you need to solve that simulation. I have a pretty good way of figuring out whether I have enough or not. As I solve it with horizon of t, and then I go to t plus 5, and I go to t plus 10, if nothing changes, I've got enough periods. Because I know the turnpike property of the models. When you're optimizing, it'll always hug the path. Now, if you have a model that has chaotic behavior, you have these agents in the model, and they're flying around, and you don't know what's going on, it's not optimizing, it's just then, yeah, you change the horizon, things can go crazy, right? So if you, if you don't have optimizing behavior going on, then that's a problem. But as long as it's optimizing, then you get, this turnpike property is very helpful. Now, there are ways that you can, you can finesse this with the stochastic program. Is that, for example, for Sven's model, he has this stochast stochasticity that's, that's persevering for a while. One way you could trim the tree would be to say, well, I know that if I were to run my, my GDP he has that nice graph that shows the range over which GDP moves 
for it getting on the horizon. So we said by 2100, we had this wide range. There's low probabilities of these events, but there's this range. So you could, at some point, you could say, well, let's just shift to a deterministic model on all the paths that, re that remain and pick uh, growth rates along those determinist paths to roughly flare out. That way, when we make early on decisions and we're concerned about the fact that policy in the early time induces different GDP costs depending on what's happened to productivity, we have that. We just don't have the hedging that's going on in the latter part of the model. To motivate this, to motivate this sort of trick, I just refer to Bellman's equations. I'm sure you could math it up and use Bellman to show that that's going to be okay. In other words, when you do a Bellman approximation, you do stochastic programming, you're not even using three, you're using two. So what you do is you get, when you use Bellman, you use two periods, you find the optimal policies, and then you put labels on them of what the, what the value functions are at the end, and then you go and do it again. So what I'm just saying is, let's do Bellman's, but let's add, let's add five or six. And if you want to get fancy, then you can estimate Chevy Chev's polynomials and put value functions at the end. You can do all that stuff. But I'm saying, first thing I want to know is, what's the problem I try to solve, and can I do it in one shot without having to hedge? Okay. okay. Is that true? Okay, I apologize. Okay. Touche. Yeah. So how much, so I, I saw two stages of that program. So how much do you gain, how much is your near term decision, how often does it change significantly by adding a third and a fourth and a fifth to the stage? I mean, my impression is that it doesn't change that much very often, but I mean, do you have a sense of that? Well, the thing is, if you're asking, I, I mean, this is what interested me in the problem. We, we were motivated by the same thing. I, I found the problem too hard with multiple technologies. But the thing is, I think the really intriguing question in climate change that we don't have a framework for looking at is, how much money do we spend on R&D and how do we distribute, distribute it? Do we, time. over time, yeah. Do we, do we spend the money now or do we, do we spend, and I can't help but believe that that's not affected by what we anticipate the threat is. But the thing is, I'm gonna give you, so you can, I'll give you a tool that you can use N, and you can choose right. N equal to three, right? I'll give you a tool that you can use, you can write it down, and then you can find out. I think that's an empirical question. Right, right, yeah. I, um, I think a lot of the, I believe that it's true that, like, Bill gave a brilliant introduction and motivation for stochastic programming, act and learn, and he just used a two-stage mo two right. model. And he got a lot of the intuition about what's going on. Right. So I'm just a plumber, I'm just showing you how to do it. Right. With more, yeah, so right? Mark Webster does have a paper that did a decision analysis on climate change, where I thought he was comparing more stages to fewer stages, but now everybody actually uses this one. Um, <laughs> I think it was a good But that's a particular problem, though. So what you're saying is you don't really know each problem. It might be important, it might not be important, and now you're going to show us that we can actually do that. I'm just in the tools that make it possible to do a rapid prototype, get a sense mm -hmm. of what's going on, and then maybe drill down to get deeper. No, no, but the, I wouldn't fix it. No, but the thing is, you, you pick how far this goes, and then you, you basically fire up your, your uh, I'm excited because I go home, I have an Alienware computer waiting for me. You fire up your Alienware computer, and you do, you do one more and let it run overnight. Right? If it's, if it's robust, then you appeal to uh, the, the uh, Turnpike Theorem, even, though, even if it's violated between Milan and England. Right? <laughs> So the So the yeah, sure.
can interpret that these are the shadow prices and the non-anticipativity constraints. There's three or four papers on that. I, okay, well, why, why am I not interested in that? Well, first is I think that if we, get, if we have a way that's cogent and intuitive, write down the type model, let's write down the type model. It's all about Pascal. Let's write a short letter if we can. If we know how to do it, to write a cogent, tight formulation, let's do that. And the other is I want to write down models not just as optimization problems. I want to have complementarity problems. And then suddenly the interpretation of Lagrange multipliers on the non-anticipativity constraints creates tr mega problems of interpretation. I mean, it's, you can do it, but it's not so easy. To I, I couldn't come up with a tight way to do that. So that's part of my motivation is I want to write a model. I would like to move to a, be able to take equilibrium models where, where firms have different attitudes toward risk and have a number of stages and have them make decisions over time interacting. Where they, there's not just an optimization problem, but there's multiple agents at once. So that's my motivation. So let's, let's look at this. Uh, I'll go through a couple of, uh, whoops. This is the same. Oh. Oh, there we go. <clears throat> so this was the uh, state of my understanding of stuff when I when uh, when uh, Eve's all Albers came to my office after taking my this rather boring business economics class in electric. He was a he's a mechanical engineering master at ETH, and he just came in and he said that course was okay but a little bit boring. How about doing something real? I'd like to. Uh, I say, oh, that's nice. You know, undergraduates, you say, okay, well, what would you like to work on? What are you interested in? Can we get you motivated? He says, no, I, I really am I'm very interested in, in whether or not we can use uh, futures markets and electricity prices and hedge those against decisions about how much water to pump in the reservoirs. He had already done all the research on it. He had, like, it was a, a real option problem, the decision about, and suddenly you bring together the reservoir decision and then you bring together the futures prices, and he already had done the research on exactly where the information was. And he said, yeah, I think, I'm not certain, but I think I can beat the guy who's scheduling the reservoirs at this big dam. I'll show you a picture of the dam. So he was like way ahead. He knew exactly what he wanted to do in his thesis. And it was, it was very, it was really uh, refreshing to work with this guy because he was so uh, well motivated. So I'll show you first the problem that, that got him interested in wh why he came to, to see me is because I have the, uh, General eccentric power is one of my, my favorite, uh, you know, uh, methods, torture devices for first year PhD students. I, so I like to give, I find that the best way to learn modeling in economics is linear programming, where you have words and you have data and you want to know the number. Oh, did anybody get the number? How many, what's the, what's the minimal concavity in, in Jim's preferences that he dates these two girls? Did anybody work on that problem? It's a good problem. I'll, I'll show you the answer tomorrow. So, so, so these problems are nice, the ones that are simple to write down. So this is a problem that says, OK, we have this, this system. We have inflow to reservoir A. It goes to power B. From B, if we generate power, then the outflow goes into reservoir for B. And from B, we have the power, and we produce power from plant B, or we spill water. So spilling water is always a possibility. And then you just want to manage this guy over time. And so the basic sort of, the, in the simplest version of this, you're given, this is actually was a dancing problem. This was from OR 340A. Did you take 340A? Kurt Anstryker was my, my, uh, my uh, anyway. So this gives you a couple months. It gives you power in megawatt that gives you the information, power capacity. And uh, so power is sold at $5 per megawatt up to 50, 50,000 megawatt hours each month. Excess power can be sold for 350. So first thing is, assume flow rates are in and out or are constant within the month. So it gives you the basic assumptions, asks you, okay, we'll solve the problem. And uh, you can do that. Typically, the challenge with uh, beginning students, the first thing to do is to write the model down in a scalar form. Which forget about the indexing is where things get messy. But just write down the model. So embed 
these indices into the variable names and just write down the model that way. So you write down levels and so forth, how spilled, how much power you produce, how much high and low cost power you, you produce. This is what's known as a blending problem. And then you basically can write down levels and uh, so forth. And then you write down equations. So the equations here have to do with keeping track of what's going on. That's all fine, maximizing revenue. So this off and running. So that's a dynamic model, but it's deterministic. So it gives you the, so if you write the same model down in GAMS, again, this is just to give you a feeling. We are talking last night, Valentina, about what we're trying to accomplish here. I mean, the thing is, learning GAMS takes a bit of, you have to like really kind of bite into it and get in, into doing stuff. I'm big on writing your own models from scratch as a means to learn, because then once you've done that, you pick somebody else's model up, you have a better chance of sort of getting your mind around it. And so what we're trying to accomplish this week is just to show you a bunch of stuff, kind of point to where stuff could go and maybe help you to show you what could be helpful for your applications. And so that, in that spirit, I'm just saying, here's a little example that you can go through. And I have a bunch more. I have 10 or 15 more I can distribute. So you can write down here, you keep track of what reservoir, what time period, how much you generate. You can put the bounds now, how, now the bounds are all indexed. And you can indicate Again, this is then looks like sigma notation. You just sum across things. You have constraint on the, that's the inflow, that's the level, plus the spill from the upstream reservoir. This S of R minus one, if you're referring to the first reservoir, then you're indexing off the set. So R minus one is off the set. In other words, you're indexing the previous reservoir where there is none. GAMS just makes it disappear. That just goes off the bat. Uh, so this indexing is, is relevant. That's the spill in the current period, and that's the power you produce. That simply says the, the, the power, the water that flows in added to the level we had, plus the spill from any reservoir upstream minus has to be equal to the spill that we had, or plus the uh, power we generate plus the level in the next period. <laughs> this is the plant that uh, Eves was interested in working on. Monster system, it's the biggest, I forget the name now, but it's like got, it's, the Swiss are absolutely nuts. It's like they're, they're uh, they treat their country as though they were doing a model train set and designing stuff because they have this incredibly elaborate system of train tunnels and then the tunnels that are for moving water between reservoirs is even more complex. And so the, this is just showing the map. They have this big reservoir in the middle, but you make decisions about how you're gonna move water and it can be done. So. It's quite elaborate uh, how the thing works. And they have a very good system for managing it, but their system doesn't take into account what the futures price is. So this shows, here's a deterministic model for a single reservoir showing the variation in rainfall over the year. And this is now a model that we're going to, again, remove now from first a little finite horizon two-period model. Then the next model you want to look at, that when you think about this sort of problem, is you think about um, how do we operate what's the best way to operate the system over the year. And so GAMS gives the ability to reference the set on a circle so you can keep track. It, it's not undiscounted, but you can determine the optimal steady state policy given this reservoir. Uh, the, this, so if we think about this, if we have what's the inflow for an overall reservoir system per month, what's the price per megawatt hour of electricity in the Swiss market that shows you for this big reservoir system, if we treat it just as one big reservoir, neglect details. You know, the rough max and min of how much water can be stored. The starting, you know, basically you can you take the data in and then you have the power as a function of the uh, level, so the turbine efficiency, the density of the water, the water head. So you can make all this stuff. Uh, that's something they normally don't do, but so you can keep track of how, how the power depends on the height of the reservoir. So here is the model in GAMS that says, okay, what's the optimal, what's the optimal structure over one year? So this has got the inflow and the price, the various, that's a very simple, sort of a simple one reservoir model. But the thing that's tricky here is that again, I don't know, do I have a little pointer here? Oh yeah. So the thing that's the tricky bit here is that this one goes to an annual So this one has an annual model. So this M plus plus one, if you index by M plus one, that says the next period. And when you get to the last period, 
Last month to December, m plus 1 would index off the set and would drop that equation. So the equation is indexed by, but here it's m plus plus 1, which will mean that, that the level at the end of December represents the level is the starting point for January. So this would be optimizing over the full year. So this says the level in the subsequent month is equal to the level in the previous month plus the inflow minus the release minus the spill. And the profit is a function of how much release and the coefficient that determines the conversion from water to, uh, to, to profit or to, to electricity. <laughs> so that doesn't have the more complicated. You could have this. You know, this coefficient could be dependent on the level, but it doesn't change by more than 4 or 5%. Well, look, no, but the thing is, I you with this sort of problem, you you feed in, you feed in what the what the precipitation is over a typical year, and then this problem will determine for you what's the optimal production profile over a typical year. Right. So, so, it's taking back so it, it'll be a steady state solution, okay. undiscounted, yep. but it's the steady state solution. I'm. I'm introducing this not because I, I know that you're not hydroelectric engineers, but I think it's helpful to get your mind around sort of how stochastic programming works. This is a useful thing to start with. You think about how this works. So here, because what we want to do is we move to a thing where we, we recognize there's variability in the water inflow, and then the decision about how much water to put in the reservoir depends on what the uncertainty is. So that's, so there's a, uh, Do something wrong, I guess. Maybe this. Oh, here. So that gives you the values. So just a digression on ordered sets. So in GAMS, when you declare a set like I, uh, I is declared one star four. That puts in one through four. And then you have a set, a set of functions that relate to that, the set elements. And this is the thing that takes the longest time for uh, MATLAB programmers to get their mind around. Is in MATLAB, you can use inde any indexing you want as long as it's integers. In GAMS, you can use integers and you can use anything else, right? So GAMS is much more of a flexible setting. You can use indexing by labels and names and you can index so it's very a generalized sort of set concept. So you have this database ability built into the language that you don't get with MATLAB. But you still can use, there are certain circumstances, and stochastic programming is one where using integers is helpful. So the integer here, you have this thing called the ordinality. If the set is ordered, that is, it's appeared, those labels have appeared in sequence in the program, then it's ordered. And the ord will give you one, two, three, four for the numbers of the thing. Okay, so that's the ordinality. It's not always the number of the thing. So if I declared that as, if I declared it as two star five, then the ordinality of two would be one, right? Because the first, the first element of the set is number two. So the ordinality is the, is the order in the set of the element. I dot val is a, is a function that returns the value of the element. So that's a, that's a new thing that's, it says if we have sets, which have numbers, then I can I can query the set to find out what the value is. So that gives you this guy. If I then go, so if you have an unordered set, so this is an example of an unordered set. If I declare, then this is one of these things. It's this thing of distinguishing in computer programming. It's always very important to be clear about what's a bug and what's a feature, right? Because a lot of times there'll be bugs or things that are sort of workarounds that are sold to you as, oh, this is a feature. Well, this is definitely a bug. This is something you have to put up with. If you're going to work with a programming language which is designed to generate 2 million row linear programs in under a minute on a PC, if you want to work on that sort of system, you have to put up with certain amounts of hassle. And one of the hassles is that the, the label, the set of labels, the heap of labels in the program, it's ordered in the order in which they appear. So there's going to be this the universal element list in GAMS is simply created as a list as it occurs. And you can't control that other than by the sequence in which you declare things. So in this case, if I declare two first, and then I declare I second, 
uh, J is just element two, and then I is one through four. When I say display I, then it's going to be two, one, three, four. I is no longer ordered because the element, the, the label two appeared before I did. So when, one of the things that I'm showing you this is because when we do stochastic programming, we need to keep the, the sets ordered. So the set of, of labels we have to keep ordered. It just means you have to be careful of what you declare first. You'll see this, and it's one of the things that, that's, that is uh, just to be aware of. The display statement conforms to the universe to element list. So it's something just to be aware of. If you try then to use the or operator on that, you'll get an error. And so if you're not careful, you'll, it'll stop you if you try to use the or. So you declare i 1 star 10 and j 1 star 10. There's no problem with using the same sets, elements in multiple sets. That's no problem. That's not a problem. But if you want to use the ORD operator, you can't declare, you can't have one set that's, 11 through, that's, that's 5 through 10 and then declare another set that's 1 through 10. If you declare the 1 through 10 first, then 5 through 10, then it's all, it's all fine. So this is just, we're going to use the ORD operator in the, the magic that we use for writing down the stochastic program is going to rely on the stochastic on the set of scenarios being ordered. So just I apologize about being kind of dry and mundane, but this is something that, that we need we need to use. Any questions? So finally when we have uh, when we have a set i, we can say, well what's what's the value of i? So that's one through five. What's i plus one? So if it's going to be um, i plus 1 is going to be the i that gives you 2 is going to be 1. So this is just the value you get of i plus 1 for i minus 1, i plus plus 1, and i minus minus 1. So the plus plus and minus minus wrap around the corner, whereas the other ones will just drop the stuff off. So if you're in element 4 and you use a 4 plus plus 1, or 4 plus 1, it gives you nothing back. So there's the report. So that's the optimal program of, of inflows and releases with those prices. And one of the things that this relates is to control theory. Again, if you use optimal control, you do the stuff in continuous time. There are certain types of controls that have this property of being bang, bang solutions. You tend to drive you to the limit. You pick the one that's the, it's like a knapsack problem. You just find where you're going to put the water that gives the highest payoff. Once you've maxed that out, you go to the next thing, you give that the highest, and that's exactly what's going on here. You go right to the limit, on the three months, we have lots of water, and then it goes into the other ones. So that shows the optimal release, and there's the actual release. Okay, so there's some difference between, it's not driven entirely by prices. So you might be interested then in saying, oh, but wait a minute, that's just the optimal steady state. We know that in any given year, there's randomness going on. What's the optimal policy, the transition, where we think about optimizing the policy from a initial situation which may not be at this optimal flow and this is keeping track so this is just I'm just I'm going to jump through this but this is if you're interested in the trend, how to do a transition looking forward in a dynamic model going out this is a way to solve a 38 month model from 20, 2011 to 2016 so that's the transition model and you can yeah we we get to, well you can see you don't have to go out there you can see it it jumps to the steady state almost immediately and then you see so here you see the steady, you see the turn by property. You're starting at 200, 202, and this guy starts at about 100. And you, you basically, it's going to be, it, it goes on the steady state. And then if you have a good terminal condition, it stays there. If you have a bad one, then it drives away. I'm not going to spend time. I, we have the other stuff we have to do, so I don't want to go through this. So now in these lecture notes, there's a simple little example of a, uh, of a two stage model of uncertainty. And again, this is just. Very simple stochastic model. We have two decisions. You don't know you know what the prices are. You don't know how much exactly you're going to get. So this is a, you know a problem with too many words. I'm afraid. But during the daytime, the operator can sell electricity at PE. At night, he can sell the uh, the reservoir must be empty by evening due to maintenance. Excess water can be sold to the local brewery. So there's a basically this gives you a little example of how how uh, uncertainty changes uh, the story. So you have these uncertainty about what the what the low 
normal and high level of precipitation is the next day. And you know what the, also in those scenarios, what, what, that's the price and that tells you the quantity that's demanded. And this then, then gives you the basic sort of in, set of constraints. And so that's just a simple two-stage problem. So it says in the two-stage model, you just have to make decisions that at the end of the first day, you don't, you don't sell more than the maximum amount. This has got to be in the second period, you, you want to you satisfy demand in that state of the world. And uh, this basically, there's a monotonicity constraint. So basically, this, this represents maximizing profit over these two states of the world. So that's two stage, this, that's set up as an as a optimization problem. So now we get to the multi-stage problem. This is why I need to go through these lecture notes just to get to this so you can see the diagrams here are useful. So <laughs> here's the tree, similar to what I've drawn here, with, with three events in each node, high, medium, low. And this is using a node-based formulation. So he's given a name to each node, N1, N2, and three, four, and five, six, seven, eight, nine. So there's a set of nodes, and see, you see that the number of scenarios then goes from S1 to S27. So the, the key thing for writing down the optimization problem is you have to keep track of what node you're in and what happens next. So if you have a, have a function that says parent of n, you say the level in node n is whatever the level was in the parent of n plus the inflow during n, plus the, uh, I forget what z is, uh, the purchase power minus the, uh, minus the, let's see, uh, I forget, I gotta get my notation straight, it's f, so r is the, is the level, l is the level, r is the, is the runoff, and f is the, uh, is the amount that you're spending for, uh, it's what this is, R max. So one is for selling and the other is letting it. Oh no, this must be, so C is the money, Z is the stuff that you buy from outside. And then uh, this is gonna be, so you're trying to maximize. Oh, that's the cost, okay. So there's a cost index here for, for F. So basically, let's see, it's gonna tell us. So here he's written down the problem where in the GAMS format where he basically keeps track of what are the realizations in each period? Low, normal, high. The time periods are December through March. The nodes will be N1 to N40. The first period is December. The root node is N1, that's the first one. And then we keep track of child and parent node. It says there's no child, but N2, 3, and 4 are children of node 1. So if you go back, that's just simply formally saying so two, three, and four go to node one, five, six, and seven go to node two, eight, nine, and 10 go to node three. So that's just keeping track of the relationship between the children and the parents in the network. And then we say, well, we also have to keep track of what are the association of nodes with time periods. So node one occurs in December, two, three, and four January. The rest are in, these guys are in February and the last ones are in March. And then we have to keep track, it's to write down the logic, we keep track at each node, what is the realization of water in that node? So the model then will have a probability of each realization. So we have a 25% low, 50% normal, 25% high. And we uh, have inflow under those different realizations that are different. And this is keeping track of the costs and then we have a little bit of uh, keeping track of what the, what the inflows are at each node. And then, the, so we write down the model. This then, once you've got the data structure set up, then it's simply you say, look for all nodes and time periods, the probability of that node occurring times the flood cost times the flooding plus the uh, cost of the, uh, of the purchase power from outside, some of the constraint that the level at the beginning of node N is the level in the previous, in the parent node, plus the inflow during N, plus the purchases from outside, minus the release, minus the flooding. So this just, the logic is simply the logic for a representative node in the network, and you write this down, the key thing is having the logic that keeps track of which nodes to occur in which time periods, so this says we're going to define a constraint 
for node n period t provided in this nt relationship. So nt was the previous, this guy here is nt that says which node occurs in which time period. And then, the, so the, the level in, in node n period t, if it's not the root node, is going to be equal to this guy, which is the, the previous from the previous time period plus the inflow and so forth. So that gives us, and here then, the root node in the first year, we know what the start level is. So we fix the start level and we also put an upper bound. So that then represents the optimal policy over that simple little network for what, the, what to do in each time period based on, on logic that's oriented around having a node index for each, for each period, for each, for each element in the tree. So if you do that, then that, that gives you a, a, that's, and this is the, one of the more conventional ways to do stochastic programming. Most of the, the, um, most of the specialized algorithms for doing stochastic programming have a node-based formulation. <clears throat> I, on the other hand, like, prefer things to be scenario-based. So that means that I have, instead of having a single index for each node, I have two indices. One is the scenario that represents it, and the other is the time period that it is. So here we think about this guy being scenario one in December, goes to scenario one in January, scenario one in February, and scenario one in March. So I keep track of exactly what, this is just giving the identifiers that I use for the, for the scenarios. And this gives you then the same tree, but it's just simply once a scenario occurs, then it stays around. So scenario one captures all of these nodes, scenario 10 captures these nodes, Scenario 19 captures these nodes and so forth. So to do that, once you have, if you have a scenario-based formulation, then, then there's this, this simplicity that derives from keeping track of what scenario represents. Scenario S in period T, we want to know, well, where does that scenario sit in the, in the, in the uh, tree? That we want to, so when we write down logic, we want to keep track of what we were doing in this scenario in that time period. And this offset pointer is a way of saying you just have an index that points back to which scenario is capturing the one. Let me just go forward. I'll show the logic here. So it says, here we say the level in period at, in state S period T is going to be the level of whatever that scenario was in the corresponding scenario was in period T minus 1 plus the inflows and so forth. So the rest of this is exactly as the null-based formulation. The key difference is this, using an offset pointer to point back to what the previous parent was. So once we have, if we construct that O array, this O array, then we can write down the equations of the model very easily. Okay. So that's, this is the same model written down. So the thing that happens then if you take this this model, and you write it down, you, get, you can go, as you increase the number of realizations, you go from two realizations to three to four to five. So here we had a high load. The, what I showed you was the data that was for three, but you could all imagine there being a wider set of realizations. And indeed, in many of these macro models, you want to think about the underlying stochastic variable being continuous. So you have to support it with a, you have to pick a set. The problem is that the, est the execution time in seconds goes up really fast if you have to. So once the tree gets big, we're sunk. So you, if you try to go after a big tree, you have trouble. But then you're, you're, so the basic argument I have is I want tools that I can build a model quickly and change the structure. I want to be able to look at what I can learn from the model with models that I can compute in reasonable time. And I, I'm concerned about calendar time, not CPU time. And calendar time is, if I have to build an, if each model, new model is a new algorithm, then that's a lot of, see, that's a lot of calendar time. But the calendar time to develop an algorithm to solve, if, you, if every model is a new algorithm, it's a lot of work. So the idea here is that can we write down things? And my argument is, okay, four or five, that's pretty good. So how many support did, did you say you needed for the, if you guys have a continuous realization, but you said, that, So the, the quadrature, quadrature methods mean you pick a set of points and you approximate what's going on. So there's a question of whether that's good enough or not. But I'm just, 
it's not that it's not hard. If we then increase the time period, this is more t symptomatic as well. Is the number of time periods, it's, if you fix six realizations and then you increase the number of time periods, everything looks fine, you get up to six, you think, oh, this is great, and then boom, it goes off the charts. So there typically is gonna be some point that's a sweet spot you can handle, and if you go bigger than that, it basically gets impossible. Just one more, because the thing is going up geometrically. So part of the reason to build a simple model is you wanna do the little tiny ones down here to get things organized and then figure out where that spot is and then figure out is that model big enough to give you insight in the question you have. So this is uh, the mapping stuff. So yeah, and so this is this uh, student going crazy. It's great. It was wonderful. It's just wonderful. Because he goes off, he immediately discovers that yes, okay, the problem gets harder as it gets bigger. But actually in GAMS, the problem is setting up the logical data structures to represent the model dominates the time it takes to solve the model. There are problems we have which take two hours to generate the, the logical structure and you get the model into CPLEX, you can solve it in 30 seconds. So the time, the time to generate the logic to write the model down, which is, it's kind of amazing, but GAMS tends to be kind of slow in certain types of operations. So he's written in his thesis, he developed a, a a uh, C++ program that generates the data structures and hands them back to you. So it comes back, so you can basically, and then he went on, he had the, the wherewithal to go on and look at this, their scenario reduction. Again, I don't wanna, I don't know because I didn't look at this in detail, but then he goes off to look at the scenario reduction techniques, which are these, there are techniques where you can take a big tree and you hand it to the scenario redu reduction technique and it looks for similarities and constructs a tree of, sm of smaller dimension that retains the same structure in some sense, stochastic structure. So you can basically thin out the tree by going asymmetric. And so the student went to look at that and lo and behold, the run, the compute time to reduce the tree exceeded the time to solve the tree. So again, the, the curse of dimensionality can, can bite really hard on these things. So I'm not a big fan of going big with, it. the technique I'm saying is, if you wanna build a big stochastic, you wanna look at something as stochastic and complicated, I say fine, but first build a little model to understand what you're going after and then once you have a little model built, the prototyped, then certainly you can test your, your model-specific algorithm by verifying get the same solution back, right? It's, it's all about, uh, computer programming is very much like rock climbing. It's all like, you never take the next pitch until you're sure that you have the, the safety established where you are. And in this game, if you can prototype with GAMS, get a, or with a, some other framework, and get a simple model that captures the ideas, then you can go to your specialized algorithm and verify that what you're doing makes sense. Otherwise, you have a big complicated model and a new algorithm, it's very hard to tell. Is this right or wrong? It's really hard to tell. No? Are you talking about things like sample average approximation or are you talking about being specialized? I, the thing is, I want to learn how to do that. I don't know how to do it yet. Uh, so that's... No, the thing is, I'm, I'm curious that may be better, actually. But it, again, it's, it's, I, the reason I didn't, I wasn't drawn to it first, I like to have a model where I simplify the formulation and I can get an exact solution. Anything where I have to get an approximate solution, I can't judge how close I am. I'm a little bit reluctant. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, that's, that's, I was just curious to see what you said. Yeah. You know, doing it, doing it, Well, the guy who works at Stanford, who's the guy that works with or worked with Danzig, uh, stochastic programming, the Austrian guy. This guy uses the sampling stuff. And he, he makes bundles of money, so I, it's like. The thing is that I, I'm not, my, the lecture today, I'm more trying to like, okay, let's get our mind around what's a stochastic program, how do you write it down? And, and I'm, I'm big on just get the simple idea straight and then we'll figure out how to do it. But, I, but I, there probably are methods that are much, no, that's, so that gives the solution time. And so I won't, I won't proceed with this, but it's, it's cool. So that's, and we won't go, I won't go further with it. But I've, I've included, so you'll find on the distribution material, 
the PDF for the, the skid's thesis and the zip file with all the with all the programs, including his scenario trees to stuff. So that stuff is a good as a starting point if you want to dig in. All the tools are there for seeing how that works. <clears throat> So, uh, let's go to uh, lectures. Uh, Thursday. Is there a problem with the one What's that? Yeah, so that was part of, I was going to jump over there. At one point, I was going to use this. So this has got, we could go through this here. There's a nice hoteling model I have. There's a bunch of stuff here. So we're not going to talk about that, but I'll talk about this at some point, and then I'll also talk about So I'm just going to go, before jumping to the DICE stochastic programming model, I thought I'd first go through a simple little model that's, that's even simpler. So it's intended to be ultra. But it does introduce a couple new ideas that we haven't talked about. We talked a little bit about calibration. Um, I was also going to show you calibration. So I'll, there's a couple things I can show you. I don't, if I go till 10.30, so I have 15 minutes? OK. So, the, um, so this is a minimal framework. So my objective was, I was really impressed by, I have to say, I was really impressed by the stuff Judd Dud has done is really cool. And the stuff that you guys have done, there's a whole bunch of people working on precautionary invest in climate. And this, this is just sort of work in progress. I don't have a paper on this yet, but I'm just kind of curious about what's the minimal tool we have to get at this question about fat tails. How do we build a simple little model to get at this question about how much damage do we have and when does it come and how does this affect things? So this was a, a first pass at that. And uh, <clears throat> so. And I have the code for this as well, included in the distribution for today. So most integrated assessment models focus on avoidance of market and non-market damage as an incentive for short-run mitigation. So the more recent work uh, has introduced a precautionary motor for mitigation. So mitigation is desirable because it reduces the rate of temperature change and thereby reduces the likelihood of catastrophe. So the key trick here is this idea that the reason to mitigate is to reduce warming, because warming can induce disasters which are uncertain. So the key thing is this makes us move from a stochastic programming format, where the uncertainty is given by, by nature, to a stochastic control format, where we, make, we undertake action to affect the probabilities of outcomes. So it's a different model. And when I first saw these, I mean, typically when you read stochastic programming, there's a nice textbook by Burge. They tend to get right up to stochastic programming, and then as soon as there's a bit of control that comes in, they don't want to talk about it, like it's too complicated, something. Whereas then the other end of the extreme is you've got the engineers who just are crazy. The engineering control guys are just crazy cool. They just do wild stuff. It's just it's completely different game than us, because they, they have to deliver stuff like instantaneously. So at ETH, in the four years I was there, my favorite talk by far was this Dutch guy who had an algorithm for control of kite-generated power, so electric power. So, so this is wind power from kites. The kites are between 10 and 15 meters across, and they're at the end of a tethered line that's 1.5 kilometers long. And the kite goes up there. Has anybody, anybody kite surf here? No kite surfers. How about st uh, stunt kites? You control with two. Ever? This is in Denmark, they do this all the time, right? I learned, I learned stunt kite, uh, these, these stunt kites in Fano Island because they have steady wind. It's really great. So these stunt kites, if you haven't done it and you've got kids, this is a blast because you get the kite to go up and then you can control how it goes this way or that way. And you won't. You know, if you've not done that, you won't really appreciate this guy's talk. But this talk was so cool because with a stunt kite, if you pull this, that controls it, and the and the thing swings, and then it comes back toward you, and then it catches the wind, and then it gets pulled back 
the other direction, right? So the whole thing is to maximize the power it generates, you fly in a figure eight. And the thing goes like this. And then it's connected to what looks like a big fish, fishing reel on the ground. And when the thing's coming back toward you, the fishing reel engages and pulls the cable in. And then once the thing starts to pull, then it pulls out on the fishing reel. So you're sitting on the ground and this, this cable is going like this, you know. This is all at the design stage. I didn't, he doesn't have, a, have an operational prototype yet, but, the, but he, has a very, he had a very cool, so the whole thing is about controlling this kite. And you think about it, the problem, is, the great thing about it is 1.5 kilometers, you can get a 90% capacity factor on that thing because the wind at high elevations can be very stable in certain areas. And so it has lots of appeal, it's very interesting. But the problem is how do you keep the kite, kite up in the air? Because even though at that level it's pretty stable, you still have situations where the wind will buffet it around and you ought to control it. And this is where, this is where the, you separate the men from the boys in stochastic control. It's like, like when, with Manfred Murari, like when Man, Manfred, when I, Manfred was on the faculty at ETH, he was such a great guy, really funny because he has this really great stochastic control program. And I said, I said to him once over lunch, I said, boy, that's a really cool program. How many lines of code is that? And he looks at me and says, that's so old fashioned. He says, in our world, the question is, how many grams of silicon is your program? Because he says, everything has to be, everything he makes is embedded in ears and in hearts. And then, you know, you have to basically, so sure enough on this kite, you can't control it from the ground because you don't have fast enough information coming back. All the control has to be on board. So the algorithm has to solve, like it's keeping track of where it is and then it has to resolve the problem in real time. So that's, it. the control guys are into this big time. They don't solve problems precisely. So the methods they use can't be immediately dropped into economics, but they do have this idea that, yeah, we just solve the problem. Yeah, we can affect the probability, go for it. You know, just the, the idea is that just a model to solve. And so that's the spirit in which I was curious about how much the stochastic control we could bring in to this framework. So I was trying to get here to formulate a minimalist model for investigating the impact of, uh, of catastrophic loss. So to begin with, I'm just going to think about GDP being exogenous. I'm not even going to have capital. I just have consumption for energy and non-energy. And non-energy, the price of energy is PE and it's given, and the price of non-energy is one. And so GDP is allocated either to non-energy consumption, to energy consumption, or to market damages. So we have, we have a motivation for abatement, which has to do with the fact that abating today loose, le lessens the amount of damages we have in the future. So, and, so the, the basic hazard rate for catastrophic loss in time t is h is equal to c sub t times delta t. So delta t is how much temperature change we've had, and c sub t is this probability of a failure as a function of how much temperature change. And where does this come from? We go to Aaron to find these numbers out, right? Or Dave, like these guys, this is something we don't know. We have to have experts tell us what's the likelihood of this or that disaster occurring. And so then the C remains fixed through a horizon. So in my formulation, I'm going to think the sky remains fixed through some point T hat and afterwards goes to zero. So that's going to correspond, T hat would be right here. So from that point, we know once we've got the T hat, then we're presuming we're not going to have damages. So again, that's a simplifying assumption. It says by 20, you know, if we don't have a disaster at some point, we're, we don't worry about it. So the probability we have a, we have a uh, catastrophic lot, not, lot of loss has not taken place in period t plus one. The prob pi sub t plus one is one minus h times pi sub t. And then the probability of a loss in time t is p sub t is equal to h to t times pi sub t. So just, it's just a simple, uh... yes? Only when temperature goes up, that's right. So if you have a period when temperature goes down for a little while and then it goes up again, it's the end of rate that's still positive for it. No, it'll still be positive, but it'll go it'll proportional so if you can cause temperature to go down, then the hazard rate will go down. I don't think that there's that many technologies sitting out there that we can use to get the temperature to go down. I mean it's possible. 
Yeah, I guess you can geoengineer geoengineering. Okay. So here's where the rabbit gets pushed into the hat, right? So it's an expression that, again, that's one that Alan always used to like. Alan always talked about, where does the rabbit go into the hat? So where do you make the assumption, the seemingly innocuous assumption that drives all your results? Because it's ultimately, that's, it's all, a, academics is all a beauty contest. It's all about like making stuff look cool. And there's always some, it's all fundamentally tautological at some, at some point. So here, I'm going to make this the seemingly innocuous assumption, which is going to like completely, it goes back to the question Sven asked at the very beginning. Sven asked, is it possible to have the scenarios, but then chop, chop them off? So we have all these, these trees. And I'm going to chop them off in this model, because I'm going to assume after the catastrophe, the catastrophe is really bad, and it's so bad, and it's so far out of my knowledge, so I'm not going to model what happens after the catastrophe. I'm going to say, consumption get, takes a big hit. So I'm going to say, it's bad. How bad? What's the epsilon delta? You have to tell me how bad, and then I'll tell you the discount rate, not the other way around, right? So it's, it's all about, so you, I'm going to take mu sub t as being given. So here we have, that should be t greater than t. So t star sub t is the time at which, this, in scenario s, that's the time in which we, we, the probability increases, and this is going to be for t less than t star. So this is keeping track of what goes on in those guys. And the tree will still involve deterministic points where you have the catastrophe occur. But what we're doing inside the model will be by, by mitigation measures, we will be we're changing the probabilities that we hit each of those things. Okay. So this is saying, so we're are then looking at it in state S. In state S, I'm going to say the utility depends on the discounted sum of utility along that scenario. And I'm here, I'm, I've got an elasticity rho sub t is the primal form of the intertemporal elasticity. So it's not Epstein's in preferences, but there's two elasticities in the model. One that describes the willingness to substitute across time, and another one that has the willingness to substitute across states of the world. So this, this first one is given by the elasticity of intertemporal substitution. And then expected utility, then it's determined by the coefficient of relative risk aversion. Again, maybe I don't have the language right, but there's this, that's, the, that's the inverse of the elasticity of substitution across, across different states. And so this, this determines the degree of risk aversion in that case. And we normalize utility such that when prices, energy prices are fixed and income is fixed, that, the, uh, that z and u is equal to 1. I'm going to explain that in, in gory detail, because the calibration is really the main trick here. The thing that's new here is that I'm going to think about there being um, no energy supplies, the price of energy is fixed, which makes the problem, makes it easier to reach the target because if energy prices don't fall, then there's not this rebound effect. So energy prices are fixed. But I'm going to assume that we have habits in terms of how much energy we consume. And so in the bottom-up type models, you typically say there's a, there's a limit on how fast we can decarbonize the economy. It turns out that you can go back to uh, Life Johansson 1962 paper showed the putty clay formulation. And so that's what it, we're doing is this is putty clay saying that we have a new vintage utility function that sub substitutes between consumption of non energy and energy. And then, so that describes substitution, but that only applies to new vintage investments. So this is just describing the substitution possibilities between new vintage investments. And that then means that I should have. Wait, I have it on the other. I don't think I have it. So the standard diagram that describes this is one that looks like that. That's going to be uh, UN. This will be CN. And that's going to be EN. So the choice is we pick a point on that, on that utility curve that, that corresponds to the relative price of of C and E, where the price of E also includes the carbon tax that may be applying out of the future. Once we've picked that point, then the, we retain the same 
that, that vintage of utility will always consume the same amounts of E and N, or E and C. So that means that I make a decision about how much, how efficient a car I'm gonna buy this, this year, and then I, I, I use that car for a certain amount of time, it depreciates over time, so that doesn't change my, my energy consumption ratio doesn't change immediately. So the key, the, the brilliance of the putty clay formulation was Johansson recognized that if we assume evaporative decay of capital with the same rate, so evaporative decay means that everything decays at the same rate, then the, then the representation of this seemingly complicated model is very simple, because that's the whole model right there. You have new vintage production, and then you have gross, gross demand, and this captures the whole idea. Lambda is going to be the survival share of old, of, old, <coughs> of old capital. It means that in a given period, how much, how much energy we can reduce only depends on what we do to the new, vi new vintage. We can't change the existing buildings. <laughs> because there, you assume that the capital, the coefficients of capital are inherited and everything decays with the capital. Now here we don't have capital, I'm assuming it's it's habits, so we, we, we bake the habits in and then there's the rate at which we can change them. So changing things takes, is, takes time. I tried last year to change, I decided last year when I moved to Wisconsin, I tried to go for a year without flying. I thought, I'm just kind of curious to explore, you know, what the, how costly, I didn't know whether my, my utility function went like that or went like this, so I thought, okay, well if I go down here, and I reduced my energy, I was curious about how expensive it was. It really was not to make a point, I was not trying to, I was just curious about, is this feasible as an economist to go for a year without flying? And I made it for five and a half months. And then my, uh, we had the college reunion and my college roommate is a, is, he had a stroke at age 40 and is a paraplegic in California and he really wanted to have us come out to California for the reunion. Then I was faced, do I say no, I'm not gonna go or so I stop. I started flying again. So I started flying again. So I was, all I can say is it's hard. Going to conferences, even environmental conferences, you send an email to the director say, I don't like to give a paper, but I really don't want to fly this year. Can I just give the paper by Skype? The answer is usually no, right? So it's, the thing is that this is just, and this has nothing to do with technology. It's just like personal introspection. How much does it cost to reduce things? Now, the functional form that we use here, this CES form, goes back actually to... Uh, this other paper. This is a, a paper from the EMF by Alan Mann and Bill Hogan, two giants of our field, written in 1977, right? So in 77, it was first realized that the CES function could describe energy demand. So this is, we've been at this for a long time with this functional form. It's one of Alan's favorite uh, poems. It's by somebody who's a, can, Sachs, I think, was around the same time as Kipling but the six men of Indistan, learning much inclined, went to see the elephant, though all of them were blind, and each by observation might satisfy the mind. So it talks about the six different guys grab different elements of the, uh, of the elephant. One guy, this guy says, I know an elephant that feels just like a broad, flat wall. This guy says, no, it's like a tree. This guy feels, so it's, it's all about the fact that we explore things. We encounter different aspects of the same problem. We come away with conclusions of exactly what it's like, but we're all sort of blind. So Alan loved that one. He was, you know, when he finished his, he was a, um, a child prodigy who started, he started to Harvard at age 16. He had been raised by his, uh, by his great aunt in New York City. And I think his, he was basically very keen to get away from his home scene. He used to talk, he didn't talk extensively about it, but he just, he didn't really like New York City that much and his, his aunt was really sort of oppressive. And so he went, he got into Harvard at 16, and then World War II came along. And the interesting thing about Alan is he and my dad are exactly the same age, and they were exactly the same way. They both went to college, bust their ass to get through so they could get out to go into, into the war. Alan finished Harvard undergrad in two years. He graduated when he was 18. And then he immediately signed up for the Navy, and he was on a Navy destroyer that would have been, if they hadn't dropped the bomb at Pearl Harbor, he would have been invading uh, uh, Japan. So it's really quite, quite remarkable. But there's this great picture of him. He's like the smallest guy on this, 
all these huge burly soldiers and they all referred to him as Plato because all he did was, he felt that he hadn't really learned enough Greek philosophy when he was an undergrad, so he used to read, read philosophy to entertain himself. So w once he came back, he went to Harvard and worked on, on scheduling of oil refineries and using linear programming, which the economics profession thought was interesting but rather arcane. And so when he graduated, he had offers to go and do academic jobs, but instead he went with the Ford Foundation to India for like three or four years. And so he came back, he has a great love of India. So that this was one of the things that he brought back with him. So it was at the time he was working on terminal conditions for, for nonlinear programming and CES functions was when he was in India. And then this paper grew out of that sort of idea. So the basic motivation here is that you have this two-way independence between energy and the rest of the economy. You know, the standard test you give your students is what's the energy value share of GDP? What do you think the student's maximum guess is for that? How much of GDP is, is energy? <laughs> You're in the first row. <laughs> so the students will say like 50%, 75%. Ten max. Five. Yeah, but I have to look really hard to find an industry where it's going more than ten. So the whole problem with, with abatement is just keeping so this is the objective of this paper was to ask how do we model the, the issue with, with reducing energy demand. So basically energy value share in the order of four to five percent. You know, you think a, a lot is made about electricity and how electricity prices are going to kill people. Electricity prices is a fraction of household expenditure, rarely more than two percent. Of course, yeah. If you're an energy exporter, then it's a different game. Yeah, sure. There, there, yeah, you can find examples. But on the demand side, it's not a big fraction. But then the question is, if you're a demander, how much does it cost to reduce energy? And that's the key point. So these guys were the first ones to sort of talk about using the elasticity as a description of what goes on. And they also emphasize here the difference between short run and long run. So Alan, at that time, was at the time he was writing this paper, he was investigating how to use putty clay in the model to have an endogenous distinction between the short run response and the long run response. And this was from their papers. So you have the zero elasticity, unitary and elasticity, and infinite elasticity. And the basic point they make here is that, think about estimates of this, the long run elasticities are between 0.2 and 0.6. With electric vehicles and stuff, the elasticity is rising recently. But it's basically, there's, so basically, I, I won't, the, but I just wanted to show you this. This diagram, they're saying, how much does it cost to reduce energy? It depends on this elasticity. So my model, I just have one elasticity that governs the demand response, the supply response, everything. But it it's basically follows along this idea. Yeah. OK. So we'll come back. And I will, that's good.